Simon, welcome to Waterstones. Thank you very much indeed. It's um, a lovely store you have. It is very lovely indeed. Um, you are no stranger to, to bookshops. You, you, you have written many books. You've I love written, bookshops. You've written for children, you've written for young adults. Three books for children. I mean, I have problems with these categories. But, you know, yes. Officially, you'll find three in the 8 to 12 section. Yeah. You'll find one in a kind of YA section. Yeah. And this is the first. It's the first that we're going to find in the adult section. Adult section. Actually, no, yes. that sounds a bit wrong. It's it like grown cliches. up section. Yeah. This is your first book for adult readers. Um, you, uh, on the front here, it says inspired by true events. And yes. as somebody who's worked very closely with film, you know that when you see that at the beginning of a film, it usually means this is completely made up. <laughs> That's right. So <laughs> it, it, it's a very, very loose term, usually, yes. But this is very much based on a real event that happened at the Dartmoor prison in 1815. Yeah. Um, and I wondered, first of all, how you had found out about this and what it was about it that had piqued your interest and why you decided to write fiction based on it rather than, for example, maybe researching it and, and writing a non-fiction book about it. Yeah, in fact, I was, I was advised by Anita Renand and William Dalrymple both said, because I was telling them about this story, they both said, you should do this as a non-fiction mm. book because this is amazing. And I was, and I thought, you know, I had thought about that, but it just, it just felt as though it was crying out to be a piece of fiction. So I decided that I could get to the heart of the story better by making it a story uh, about a 16 year old, very striking American white sailor who arrives back end of 1814. He's, trudging across Dartmoor, uh, going to this hell hole, you know, the most appalling prison that Europe probably had. Um, but he's singing, and he's singing, and he's relatively happy because he th he's got some good news. He, think he knows that the war is over. Mm. So he doesn't think he's going to be there for very long, because if there's no war, you can't be a prisoner of war, right? Mm. But that turns out to be not quite so simple, and he's there for four months, and in that time... He will witness a smallpox outbreak, uh, escape attempts, find himself holed up in the only black block because the accommodation is uh, segregated, which as a white sailor he finds rather odd, uh, and he'll fall in love. So uh, there was the non-fiction way of going around, and, and that would still be an amazing way of telling this story, which has been untold for 200 years, but I just thought I will... I'll use the other way of going in and telling it, and hopefully it comes to life that way. You've mentioned there the segregation that exists mm. in the prison. There, there is uh, th this strange thing that these sailors, having fought together side by side and not yeah. segregated by race, when they get to this prison, there is a, a block that is filled with black sailors and everybody else is white in the yes. other blocks. And yet, of course, what the black sailors do with that situation is they create their own sort of mini kingdom, don't they? They have this yeah. extraordinary figure who's their, their leader called King Dick, who is a real person. King Dick, is a re King Dick is a real person. King Dick is one of the reasons why I wrote the story, because, I mean, the segregation is one thing. The fact that it's an untold story, the fact that it's the only time there's been race segregation in the British prison, mm. that hasn't been told. But King Dick is this astonishing uh, character who is the tallest and strongest prisoner. He's a black sailor out of Maryland. He's either six foot six, six foot seven, or seven foot, depending on who you, depending on who you believe. Uh, he goes everywhere with a, a, a club in one hand and a bearskin hat on his head. He's a gangster, he's an absolute gangster. You know, he meets out justice the way he sees it uh, should be dispensed. But he loves theatre. He's a theatrical impresario, and so he puts on Othello and Romeo and Juliet. You know, and I was thinking, hang on a second, hang on, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> hang on a minute. You mean that there was this, a production of Romeo and Juliet in 1814 in, in in Dartmoor Prison in the only black block in amongst seven? I thought, okay, there's the story. There is this great sort of theatrical element to the book and, and in fact you've actually structured the book with a, a five act structure uh, influenced yes. by, by Shakespeare. Yes, the Romeo and Juliet is five acts. So yeah, so yeah. Was, that always, was that always your sort of premise when starting out or did you come across that structure as you went along and, and did you find that it helped no, it you? Came, it no, came, it came, everything came very quickly actually. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as I thought, as soon as the Romeo and Juliet um, play came to mind, the idea of writing it in five acts like Romeo and Juliet seemed to me the obvious way of doing it. And it's, it absolutely isn't a retelling of Romeo and Juliet, that there are some echoes 
of the story, some mirroring of the characters, and it just provided a useful way of telling the story. And obviously with an all-male prison and the performance of Shakespeare, yes. we're, we're back into this almost the Shakespearean original sort of method of, of doing those plays. And that throws up all sorts of interesting ideas about gender uh, and indeed sexuality. So we have Joe and he meets a, a black prisoner called Habs yes. in, in that block and they are our Romeo and Juliet. They are our Romeo and Juliet, yes. And this throws up a sort of, I guess not a struggle for Joe, but it's certainly he is surprised by what that makes him feel. I didn't set out to do that at all. I think um, the momentum of the story and the momentum of their relationship was one of the things that changed a bit as I went through the story. Um, for the f I, I've never written a story before knowing exactly what was going to happen at the end. Mm. But because this, is a f because this ends in a massacre on April the 6th, 1815, sorry, spoiler, but you know, it is out there, <laughs> I knew how it was going to finish. Yeah. So I knew what I was working towards. So I had planned this book far more than I'd planned any other book. So I knew that they were our Romeo and Juliet, and I knew that they kind of uh, would fall for each other. But that was it, mm. really. So everything else emerged from the momentum of the story, mm. uh, I think. I think it's a very, it's a very gentle relationship, you know. Um, I don't think it's, I, don't, I wouldn't want to overplay it, but they are, an all-male Shakespeare is, of course, as you said, is, is, is nothing strange. In fact, the first Juliet was a man called Richard Goff. There's a character called Richard Goff in, in here, just as a kind of a nod to the people who might get that. Um, so having all-male Shakespeare is not the thing. Having a mixed-race Romeo and Juliet, that's the thing, and that's the thing that's the explosive mm. in the book, which is the thing which is shocking and controversial, is the fact that in Act 1, Scene 5, which is where they meet for the, Romeo and Juliet meet for the first time and they kiss for the first time, because, of course, the whole story takes place, their story takes place over four and a half days, you know, mm. that's super fast. So that uh, it's the fact that one is black and one is white and that they have to kiss. That's the, like, the, the spark, which is always going to be difficult and is a huge issue through that. So, so the momentum of their relationship just came from the writing. But it's still quite a restrained, I don't want to overplay it, you mm. know. It's, it's the story of what happened in this Romeo and Juliet story and it's the story of what happened in the massacre so there are big themes running here and their relationship is just one of them. Just to finish off you have combined real historical figures with your own uh, sort yeah. of creations um, and I wondered whether you had more fun fleshing out the real historical characters or creating the, the completely new ones afresh for you, as a, for you as a writer which is the most stimulating. So I think the most difficult one was King Dick, because he is a central character mm -hmm. in the book. And the, the three main characters are Joe and Habs, which I've made up, King Dick, which I haven't. And I think the issue there for me, the most difficult thing was to, get, to make him, f because he's such an extraordinary character. If I'd made up King Dick, yeah. you'd be sitting there saying, come on. It's a bit over the top. This is, <laughs> it's, it's exactly, it's so over the top um, that trying to get to the heart of who he was and what he was trying to achieve, mm -hmm. I think was the most difficult thing in the book. How did he speak? How did he stand? How did he hold himself? How did he behave? How do you get the marriage between being a gangster and being a theatrical impresario? Yeah. How, how do you do that? I think getting the essence of who King Dick was mm. was the most difficult thing, I would say. But also, you know, you have that sense of responsibility. You know, don't stuff this up. I mean, King Dick has been referred to in other books he was even in a film in, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, and it's, so he's on the fringes of some black culture in America. Mm. Over here, no one, absolutely nobody knows anything about him. So I felt as though this is the, f this is the first big opportunity to get this right. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously everyone else will decide whether <laughs> I've got it right uh, or not. But certainly that's, that's a tougher gig than just starting from scratch yeah. and, and inventing a new character. Well, Simon, best of luck with the novel. It's, uh, it was a great read. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure.